So we're here with yes. Simon Furman, AA yeah. 2010. Uh, Simon, thank you for joining us. Thank you very Good much. Good to be here. The man who effectively created the Transform, breathed flesh to the bones of the Transformers universe back in the 1980s. Uh, for those who don't read, the, haven't read the comics, you idiots. Um, <laughs> you should. Get, get going right now. <laughs> give the people just a brief rundown of where you started with it. and. Well, I mean, I started back in the days of Marvel UK when they just started to originate their own material. So uh, they were reprinting the American stories. But because the American comic was monthly and the UK comic was the fortnightly and then weekly, they simply didn't have enough reprint material. So they brought on British creators um, to create new material, to create stories that we kind of wedge, you know, sort of seamlessly as possible in between the American stories. So when I, when I came on the scene, there was one already underway, which was written by Steve Parkhouse and being drawn by John Ridgway, which was Man of Iron. Mm. And they just asked me for ideas, and I pitched them the enemy within, and the rest is kind of history. And, yeah. and you know, from there I went, you know, right the way through the UK run to the US and onwards. So, uh, yeah, it's been a, it's been a fair journey. Yeah, yes, to 25 years in the making. <laughs> yes. So, what got you to go to Marvel to start with? Was it just um, a, a, a job, or was it, it something with the universe that grabbed you? No, 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 it was just a job. I knew almost nothing about Transformers at this point. I mean, it's very early on. Mm. I don't, it, it must have started screening in the UK by this point, but being 20 or whatever I was at the time, it you know, it hadn't impacted on me at all. So I was completely just handed a sheaf of papers and, and character biographies and, you know, a few toys, and, you know, there you go. Now we've got stories. It. And, you know, obviously there was the American material that had already been published. So, no, I was sort of, you know, at ground level, really, as far as the UK was concerned. And Transformers, you know, I, I had no idea it would ever last. So it was only ever another job, you know, to start off with. It's only that, you know, as we went along, it sort of morphed into something bigger. And we kind of had a feeling that it was going to be more than just a flash in the pan toy license. I mean, you, you know, say so you started off with just job, but before too long, I mean, re reading the stories of when you were ending up editing as well as writing, and you're under different assumed names because it was. I mean, have you experienced anything since then? <laughs> you know, that magnitude of no, work no. at level. And you know, we never thought Transformers would. You know, I mean, I at one point I stopped being assistant editor on Transformers and became the editor of Thundercats. And that was the way it was supposed to be. Then I would that would be fine. I can continue writing for the comic. Hmm. But then the editor Ian Rimmer left, which left them really without an editor who knew anything about Transformers. So they swapped me back onto that. At which point, yes, I was kind of writing. I was I, I was editing myself, which Marvel, the parent company Marvel, frowned upon. Hmm. So Richard Starkings, who was our uh, senior editor would edit my stories and I was just the line editor on the comic. But you know, yes, that involved doing the letters pages and doing the, the intro pages and everything else. So so yes, I became kind of heavily involved in it. Mm. Yeah. And, until I left staff there, you know, and went freelance. So, uh, and then other editors came on, Ewan Peters and, and a few others after that. At that point, you stopped doing the letters pages and everything? Yes. I think anyone who read the comics back in the day will remember the likes of sound waves and Grim Grams as being one of the highlights of the uh, the you know the comic because it's all the in-universe stuff that sort of yeah I mean added something silly I mean, to it but whenever I left in 1989 I stopped doing anything other than the scripts so uh, you know at that point you know I, I can't I think they probably changed letter answer again but you know I left in the middle of I think dread tidings and mm. and so yeah you know sort of but yes up to that point I was pretty much everything on that and then you went over to Marvel US yeah, I mean, we, we'd had kind of visits from various editors and uh, senior editors and, and editors-in-chief from Marvel US. And this particular time, um, Tom DeFalco was over and Bob Budiansky were over, was over. And, you know, Bob and I got on well and, you know, we'd talked before, but this was the first time we'd met. And over one sort of famous lunch in uh, Covent Garden, Bob just said, well, actually, I'm winding down on the book and, you know, do you want it? And, you know, I said, OK, yeah, that sounds good. You know, if this is the way it's done, I'll have it. But, you know, he then qualified that by saying, and, you know, it'll probably only last about five more issues. Ah. And I just went, you know, he said it's on the verge of cancellation, five more issues maybe. And I said, oh, you know, I'll still take it. You know, mm. it's still my first American Marvel credit and no problem. 
but you know we got another 25 issues out of it so you know we we did quite well and you know by today's standard it was still selling gangbusters when they cancelled it you know it was selling something in the region of 70,000 which by today's standards would make it kind of a best selling top 10 so that's top comic. 10 yeah. top 10 numbers that isn't it that's but uh, you know marvel had a cancellation policy of 100,000 at the time anything oh, under 100,000 gone and so Transformers, they let run for a bit, but in the end, it was cancellation material as far as they were concerned. Mm. And what brought about G2? Because, you know, they cancelled it, but then they suddenly went, OK, a couple of years later, let's, let's bring it back. Uh, I'm sure that was, you know, I'm sure it started with Hasbro again. You know, they wanted a comic. There was no TV show for G2, no, you know, new yeah. TV show. So I think, you know, they wanted some kind of support material for it. And I really don't know the ins and outs of, you know, who came to who and who wanted it done. But the next thing I knew, my editor, the guy, Rob Tokar, who'd ended up the editor on the original G1 book, was going to be editor on G2. Mm. So he came to me, of course, and, you know, we just carried on more or less where we'd left <laughs> off. But, you know, again, it wasn't to be really, you know, we got 12 issues and, and that was the end of that. But, you know, and that really was when I thought, you know, that's it, you know. It was Transformers maybe, is done for, yeah. something I did and I enjoyed it and everything else. But I had no idea that, you know, five years on or whatever, mm. it would all be sort of back. Starting again, and that, of course, takes us up to the Dreamwave era. Yeah. Which you came on board and did uh, the War Within series and... But slightly before that, I kind of got back into it because I was invited to the BotCon in 1997. Mm. And for that, I had to turn around. Again, I, I hadn't really been paying attention with what was coming out. So <laughs> it's like there's this thing called Beast Wars and we want you to write a 16-page comic. Oh, right. No pressure. So, you know, <laughs> so I kind of had to do a definite crash course on what Beast Wars was and they had their exclusive toys that they wanted in it. So that was actually my first reintroduction to Transformers and it was at that convention that I met Bob Forward who you know eight months on started talking to me seriously about doing an episode of the cartoon series yeah. and then the kind of next step even before Dreamwave again was that I was working I was doing some editorial stuff for Titan Books in the UK mm. and you know Titan are a big publisher of graphic novels and collected editions and I pitched to them the idea of collecting the Marvel American US comic material and so you know we managed to secure that license which was for the world just before the Dreamwave thing kicked in and suddenly it was very popular yeah. again so you know for a good while Titan had exclusive world rights on all the previous comic material and they pretty much were able to reprint everything as well weren't we they? did yeah and we talked to Marvel and got, got their okay to use the Death's Head ones and and you know, and it, and because again, Transformers wasn't particularly back in any big way, but at this point, neither Marvel nor uh, Hasbro had any much kind of investment in it. So you know, the idea of you know running everything didn't bother anybody at the time. So yeah, we were quite lucky, and even to the extent where we paid Marvel a little bit of money just so we could run the one-page Death's Head story that you know we'd used to copyright him back in the day. Mm. So. You know, it was all very amicable, and I think only later, once the Dreamwave, you know, bubble was at its as biggest, did everybody start to kind of clamp down on, you know, what could be done by who and in yeah. what territory. So uh, because the recent reprints, of course, have lost all the Spider-Man is issues, yes. Death's Head issues, yeah. the um, circuit, circuit Breaker, breaker issues, yeah. you know, which is a good chunk of the story. Yeah, definitely. especially the ending to it as well. Yeah. It's kind of it's kind of key. Yeah. Um, so we came we came up to Dreamwave and we, just to go back. You actually just mentioned Death's Head there, and obviously we're probably never going to see a Death's Head official new series or back in Transformers. Yeah, well, he was back recently. He was in a thing called Sword mm. as a guest star in his giant sized form. So you know he's around. You they, know they, they still haven't completely. No, 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 and you know I think you know I don't you know unfortunately they can Sword after five issues, which was a great shame. But uh, nevertheless, you know, he's back and I think, you know, there's always the potential. He's still a Marvel character and if I can get the right editor interested, you know, it'd be great to do some more. Mm. And, I mean, in the UK comics, you created a lot of characters that weren't toys or weren't obviously put by Hasbro. Did you, you know, explicitly go to make a character that hasn't got a toy out there? You just went, I would need this character, so I'm going to make Straxus, for example, or... Um. 
I mean, rather than use one of the existing. Sometimes we just wanted a character that it, it, we could do whatever we wanted with. So it, you know, you weren't tied by the fact that it was a toy and Hasra might object to you killing it off or you know whatever. We just needed some characters that felt like they were unique to us. But Death's Head was a strange one because Death's Head came was just a happy accident. We we really you know I wrote this I wrote issue one one three or whichever it was and. And, you know, all it called for was a sort of fairly generic badass bounty hunter character who was going to be in and out of that story quite quickly and killed off. But when I saw Jeff's art for the character, mm. I just thought, oh, no, 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 maybe, maybe, good maybe, we, maybe we can do more with this. So I kind of rewrote a lot of the, the script. So we gave him his mannerisms and, dial, and dialogue ticks and everything mm. else. And... Um, and yeah, you know, from that it just grew and grew and suddenly, you know, it was like this mad rush to produce a one page strip so that, you know, we could technically copyright it Marvel. So, uh, so yeah, it all sort of changed on the fly really with Death's Head. And with that stuff that you created back then that I say, didn't have a toy at the time, did you ever think 20 years later you'd be getting a Dark Mount or Strax's toy and the fact that you've got characters like Macabre in Squadron X and of course impacts are in wreckers yeah no no no. i mean you know that in still at that point i don't think i had any idea that anything we'd done carried much weight currently you know my mm. first botcon was a revelation because it was here were people who knew my stories far better than i did at the time <laughs> you know the first botcon was a bit of a nightmare because the question and answer thing i was kind of i don't know i don't remember that actually mm. and you know and i didn't and so you know by the next time I'd made sure I'd reread everything and uh, and kind of just reimmerse myself in it because it was done really, mm. and I never thought it would come back and we never sort of really saw the Dreamwave thing coming of just making it not just back in comics but a kind of huge success or, yeah, in terms of sales. Time. So you know, I mean, there's lots of good things about the Dreamwave thing and then there's the bad things about the Dreamwave thing. So which uh, we we won't discuss. Well, you know. <laughs> I must admit, I'm not averse to discussing it, you know, these days. <laughs> Enough kind of time and water under the bridge has passed, but, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's it, maybe not relevant. Yeah, it was a, a sad end to what was some fantastic stuff. Yeah. I mean, uh, near say, so you came on board. Did, were you approached to go on or did you approach them? Uh, no, they approached me and, you know, they said, you know, because really initially the first was written by Chris Saracini, I think, mm. and, and Pat was drawing it. And then afterwards, they kind of once they'd got that out, they came to me and said, "Well, what do you want to do?" And and I was like, well, "What do you mean, kind of just I can tell you what you want to publish?" And so you know, really, I just thought, "Well, I want to tell Cybertron stories." Mm. And so that was the war within. And uh, and you know, they gave me a largely free reign to do what I wanted. You know, I mean, we and so you know it would have been great you know the, the one regret I have is that we didn't finish off the war within no. the last war within I think you could pretty much talk to any fan of that time and say it's a regret that we haven't yeah. finished that off and again you then went straight on to creating new characters The Fallen yep um, who has of course since been in the movie yep. for better or for worse <laughs> um, but you then went on to Armada the Armada comic yep. and without pulling punches turned it from terrible to a damn good read well, I mean, I've always thought that, you know, I, I, I kind of like a challenge sometimes. You know, G1, you know, you're, you're on a sort of fairly sort of even wicket with that. Mm. And, you know, you, you you have to do a lot wrong to do wrong. But with Armada, you know, I could see they'd approached it like the cartoon, which was quite kiddie and quite basic. And, and I just thought, oh, no, to hell with that. You know, I'm just going to sort of do what I want. And, uh, and you know, we got a, you know, I, I was very pleased with Armada and Energon and, again, you know, especially with Energon, we were, again we were flying with our, with the kind of story we had we were telling, and and it was a shame that those issues, the next clutch of issues, were I'd seen a lot of the well, I mean obviously I'd written them, but you know I'd seen a lot of the art for it, and Alex's stuff was just coming mm. on leaps and bounds at that point. So it was a it was a crying shame we never got to do those next few issues. And it was the fact you're only what I think four issues away from start from starting Cybertron. Yeah, it was something like I think we had something like four or five issues until it morphed again mm. into Cybertron. If that if you know if that's the way it would have gone. Mm. But uh, so yes, it was all building to its own kind of big dramatic yeah. conclusion. And and that was the end of Dream uh, Dreamwave with in essence and um, everything. You say I water under the bridge of the time it's gone. It's over. Then we had the, the lull period. Again, did you think that's it? Transformers 
No, no, no. That, never not, thought it was going to go. In fact, at that time, you know, it was it was evident that somebody else was going to pick it up straight away. Um, and you know, I don't think there was any doubt it, somebody would have had it. Mm. You know, I mean, there were too many publishers interested in picking up that license after Dreamwave went for it not to have happened. So, especially with the numbers that Dreamwave pulled out that first series or two. And, and you know, really very quickly after Dreamwave had gone, you know, talk. You know, I was talking with IDW about you know what became infiltration. Mm. So and again, IDW, can we get onto that straight away? Yeah. Were you? Going to them and saying once you heard they had the license, or did they come no, to speak they, to you? Again, they were very much came to me, and what I liked was they came to me and said, "Look, you know, we we looks at, looks on the cars. We've got this license. What do you recommend we do?" So you know, it was quite nice that they kind of said, "Well," and I, and we had two choices. We either did a kind of the first thing I pitched was a kind of crisis on multiple Cybertrons, where we just get rid of all the tangle continuity and just boil it down into one core thing that we would then carry on with. But that was judged, and probably rightly, maybe too confusing and off-putting for new people mm. trying to, because they really wanted to kind of bring a newer audience in as well. And um, so we decided just to reset and restart everything, but in a kind of more ultimate way. You know, mm. I mean, our model really was the kind of ultimate Marvel line, of 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 not sort of just filling each issue with you know battle upon battle and everything else, but kind of telling it a more sort of leisurely pace if you like and and try and do it in a vaguely real world sense of how it might be if you know mm. giant alien robots were on our planet you know and and the reasons for why you know we didn't want to rehash the whole arc crash landing four million years thing so it was it was well okay why are they on this planet and that was where you know we started to come up with all the rationale of these kind of secret invasions mm. and the sort of autobot response to those i mean that was the thing with the infiltration series coming out, it was completely different Transformers. You say it wasn't battle on battle, it was introducing the phases and making the Decepticons go from this bunch of ragtag psychos to an actual military threat almost. Oh. It seemed a real change of pace for the entire Transformers. Yeah, and you know, and you know, really. I mean, it was met with kind of very mixed reactions. I think you know, a lot of people found the pace too kind of slow. I mean, I even heard the word glacial at times. You know, but. You know, I mean, we were determined to kind of play that out properly. So the kind of response to the negative we were getting was Stormbringer, mm. which, you know, we thought, well, okay, if there's not enough robots in each issue, and we take the point there that, you know, sort of we are really were phasing in the characters slowly over the course of the first six issues. You know, Prime doesn't turn up till issue six. No. So, um, you know, we that was kind of the response that we took on board was to turn around and go, well, let's set one on Cybertron and give you all the robots you want and all the fighting you want. Yeah, so four issues of hell breaking loose. <laughs> yes, exactly. And so, you know, and it was great. I thought, oh, well, there you go. You know, I can reuse Thunderwing and bring him <laughs> back and we'll have Bludgeon somewhere in the mix. And, you know, it was great. You know, I mean, it was one of those happy things, you know, where, you know, the, the, fan, the fan feedback was actually quite positive because I think if maybe we had just pushed on with just infiltration and et cetera, et cetera, it, we may have lost readers, but I mm. think, you know, Stormbringer kept everybody happy while we built up and built up the main series. And then, you know, we, you know, we came upon the idea of doing the spotlights, which added yet another dimension yeah. in kind of digestible bits that people could read or don't have to read, but have some kind of payoff in what's happening yeah. in infiltration escalation. You get more out of it for reading them, but as you say, the story still tells itself without yeah. having to have them there. And then obviously, infiltration went into escalation, into devastation, and then the whole run just ended quite abruptly with revelations. Now, I've heard various accounts of why or what happened or what was originally entailed. Can you well, I mean, tell us? I think, you know, to be perfectly honest, I think sales weren't holding up as much as IDW wanted. So they felt the need to reinvigorate and do it quite quickly. And, you know, I completely understand that. You know, mm. it's, a, it's a financial business proposition in the end. So, you know, they wanted to do All Hell Megatron, which was completely their prerogative. And, you know, however, what I felt about the execution, it was, you know, that's, they saw that as a kind of rebooting it and getting sales back up, mm. and that's fine. So, yeah, you know, they asked me to convince, condense what had been intended as two miniseries more or less into one and then it became four spotlights and so you know it kind of got crammed a bit but you know I got to do Maximum Dinobots so I was very happy at the time you know 
I got to do my, that story in quite the way it was supposed to finish. So, you know, Maxim Dinobots had kind of everything I needed, but Revelation was a little bit on the cramped side, which mm. was a shame, you know, because we just had to conclude the whole Dead Universe storyline, which would have gone on into, into expansion mm. in one hit. Which, you know, say, with the amount that you'd built up of 18 issues plus all the spotlights isn't easy to do, I yeah. Um, and then, of course, you then came off Generation 1 yep. and into Titan movie books, yep. um, which have been some fantastic stories, I have to say, in there. Um, I agree. From, <laughs> from the first movie, the best stuff they, that was produced for the first movie. And now you're back currently doing Nefarious. Yep. And that finishes the end of this month, I believe. I think issue six is out, yes, yeah, soon, anyway, yes. Next week. Yeah. Next week. yeah. So, yes, so, and that's been great fun. and. And strangely, even though I'm not the big, world's biggest fan of the movies themselves, you know, I just don't think I'm the target audience for them. So, you know, I mean, that, and that's fair dues. You can't argue with $700 million at the box office worldwide. So, you know, whatever the case, whatever we might think about them, you know, they make money in Hollywood and that's what matters. Yes, and, and that's why they'll keep being hmm. the same. But, you know, that said, I kind of like the idea of, of taking that universe and trying to tell a more sort of, slightly grown-up, character-led story in it. And so that was where Nefarious came out of. Nice. And with Nefarious, I mean, we're reading it at the moment, reviewing it at the moment, and it's getting stronger and stronger with every issue. I have to say, it's, I'm actually looking forward to issue six, and I'm not a big fan of the movie myself. Did you outwardly choose to make it more of a human-driven story? Because it seems very much to focus on, it for the, up until issue five, Galloway's arc, and then... Um, I can't even remember the guy's name. <laughs> Carter Newell. <laughs> Carter Newell. Um, and his journey through it, rather than have the the Transformers as almost a a separate story, part of the story. Yeah, I mean, I hope it's a balance. I hope it's not too human-led. I mean, but, you know, the vibe of the movies is very much, you know, it's happening on Earth, so there are humans involved mm. in this. And, you know, I wanted to kind of show a storyline where the humans weren't slightly just sort of played for almost comedy value. You know, Sector 7, I felt they kind of, you know, just turned them into a sort of, you know, a comedy sort of, you know, joke almost, you know. You know, however, the, you know, I'm sure, it, again, it plays well with the audience, but I just thought, well, there's no credible human threat, and I just felt that, you know, I really would like to create one that feels like, you know, they are, they are not, they are out of control, the Transformers, for once, that, you know, Autobots and Decepticons, none of them really have as much of a grasp on what is going on as they think. Even mm. Soundwave, who's this guy who thinks he knows absolutely everything that's going on, you know, is taken completely out of his comfort zone because for once he doesn't know what's going on and and that kind of hurts him far more than any kind of, yeah. you know, violent stuff that happens to him. So, you know, I mean, I wanted and I wanted to play with Soundwave. I thought, you know, he's the kind of Decepticon they've left. I didn't want to use Megatron because that would inevitably impact on you know, movie three and would be difficult and Starscream likewise and both of them had kind of been used a lot so mm. it was great to kind of again take a character that was had a scene in the in Revenge of the Fallen I think and you know yeah, pretty much. and a little Just computer barely. voice yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you know to again sort of turn it into a, a movie version of the sound wave we all know and love with his mini militia of yes, uh, exactly. yeah. which... and being in charge of all the information that he can find <laughs> And, you know, and also just to make him, you know, not just a guy who goes out and hits things, but is much more manipulative and is almost kind of conquering the planet in, in secret is his, you know, just information is power is mm. his kind of, you know, his watchword. And, you know, so whereas Megatron made a colossal hash, hash of it, he's kind of quietly doing a good job. Yeah. So, you know, it was just great fun. And I hope there's enough, you know, Transformer character stuff as well as human arc and development but you know I wanted to play off the Galloway thing I thought that was one of the interesting things they had in the second movie that again just didn't really go anywhere yeah um, and I you know I thought you know so that's you know that's one level but I wanted the Autobots and Decepticons again to kind of real to appreciate mankind as a credible threat whereas they clearly haven't up to this point no and you've you've made mankind a credible threat because you've um, we well, discussed it, the introduction of almost the layers of it, that, that you have the Decepticons who are able to go and wipe out unprepared humans, mm. but a prepared human can take them apart. Yeah, and you know, I wanted to tie it into their whole sort of mythos of, 
of seekers and things like mm. that and give it a whole history because you know I always felt that you know the machination in in G1 worked because again it was a transformer behind it and they'd had a lot of time and preparation to get that good and I wanted there to be a long time for this guy to have got good at understanding transformer technology and and how to defeat it and control it and everything else so you know I wanted to kind of embed it right in the sort of the whole seeker storyline mm. that you know has been established in the movies and in the uh, tales of the fallen comics so you know you have this sort of head in a box which is unfortunately a wee bit like the machination but you know he is kind of one of the seekers mm. and you know and it's just great to be able to kind of show a couple of those seekers you've never seen before and uh, you know and i think there's a little scene in six one of them where we see the Oh, we might have already seen the flashback to the kind of crash. I don't know. Anyway, but there's, you know, you Spoiler actually, alert. yes, you actually, <laughs> you actually see these cuffs, these seekers, and you understand what happened to the seekers a little bit in this gulf of time where yeah. they obviously weren't finding what they were supposed to find. So anyway, you know, but it was it was just fun to do, and I really enjoyed it. When you pitched it to IDW, how much did you have to speak to Hasbro or to movie studio, or how much did you have to take into account that you couldn't? Effect, effect, you know, the third movie. Um, I think you know because nobody, even then, I probably even the movie makers didn't know what the third movie was going to be. You know, I think you know it was staying away from the the main iconic villains that mm. was probably going to be the thing because Megatron kind of disappears at the end of the the second movie and we don't really know what state he's in and and it was just staying away from anything that you looked like they were going to pick up on and Soundwave you had a distinct feeling they weren't going to say well suddenly Soundwave's this or that I think he'll probably always just be a kind of satellite or something and he's actually been in the, the Chicago shoot they had the heads on the poles for the actors and Soundwave's there oh is he yes. oh there you go so you know maybe they've kind of taken a cue from the various, you know I mean if, if he's got a little Rhino running around with yes. it. Yes. Yeah. That would be cool. Be cool. Um, and b before we go back and speak about the individual comics, what's next for Simon Furman, especially in regards to Transformers, because yeah. people want to know. Well, I mean, strangely, I'm not doing an awful lot of Transformers at the moment, you know, and and that's kind of good in one way because I'm, you know, my career is going in slightly different directions. Mm -hmm. But you know, I always want to be attached to Transformers, and so you know, I'm continuing doing the UK stories. I've just finished a five-part story for Takara and Million Publishing in Japan, okay. which will appear in the toys initially that they release over there, their movie toys, and then Million Publishing will gather it all together in one of their sort of generations magazines. Mm -hmm. And you know, so it's, it's basically 40 pages of, of movie continuity story that you know, Guido Gidi drew and it looks amazing. You know, the colouring is, is out of this world and, you know, I really can't wait to see it all published now. Are we going to get a translation over here? Well, I hope that when Million Publishing print it, they'll do what they did with my little two-pager I did for them, for uh, Generations 3. They, they, mm. I did one of their little two-pagers with Skids and Screech, which are the, the little two-pack. And uh, with that, they published the translation in the back of that issue. Oh, yeah. So, you know, it's in, in full size, it's in Japanese, but at the back, they've got a little sort of mini version of it with the English Excellent. in blue. So I hope they do that yeah, again. Hopefully, and hopefully yeah. a bit easier to get the Generations books to this side of the, uh, the world. And then IDW, you know, I'm always talking to IDW about what we can do next, but in, strangely this time, it's almost been my time that's been limited, and, and my response to you know, giving them what they need to kind of, you know, talk and further the next series, whatever that may be, has been slow. So, you know, there's a couple of things we've been talking about sort of bubbling under at the moment that just need my attention and Andy Schmidt's attention and we all need to talk. And, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, for 2011 I'll have a couple more things for them. Mm. But at the moment I'm knee-deep in a 100-page StarCraft graphic novel, which is going to be published by Wildstorm. Um, and I'm working on a kids animated TV show called the Matt Hatter Chronicles mm -hmm. which is going to be coming out next year and I've been again really heavily involved in that both on the writing side and sort of script supervising as well to get their kind of you know the whole sort of character stuff and everything consistent across the series so that's taken up a lot of to my time and you know, it's only now I'm starting to think, you know, I, I can, I've got some spare time to look at some of these pitches and yeah. sort of ideas that have been idling a little bit. 
that's pretty much your 25 year history. Yeah. I'll turn it over to Amy for, um, the, for the character stuff and yeah, for what was, we reviewed recently. I was recently. actually going to ask you before we start doing that, just because, you know, you are writing all the time. Where do you come up with stuff? <laughs> How do you keep it going? I mean, um, you know... I mean, you just know, out of I, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I hope that I never run out of Transformers stories because it's such a rich universe and it changes and it's the characters are slightly different and there are different stories to tell with them. But you know, I mean, it's one of those questions writers aren't allowed to ask themselves where it comes from, the just, enthusiasm and the drive. And, and I do try and keep the enthusiasm dry. And inevitably, you find you know elements of of stories you've written before kind of mirroring if you look closely enough at them but I try and keep it as fresh as possible and I'm you know I still enjoy doing Transformers so you know I never want to not have some Transformers work on you know I'd always want some and it may kind of be scaled down a little bit if I kind of push more into TV animation because mm -hmm. you know ultimately I think that's where I'd like my career to go I'd like to be doing more TV and and you know maybe less comics but I always want to keep a little bit of comics and a little bit of Transformers going some way or other so you know I, I, you know as long as I, and the good thing with writers is you, you tend not to get jaded on one thing because you're bouncing from four or five different projects all the time so you know you've always got to you can refresh all the time really good that's awesome I mean, the, re the reason why I was asking is just because I'm dabbling myself with writing and so when you're new at it you just all your doubts and all of the things that you know you get into that so <laughs> yeah I mean you know if you've got enthusiasm for it and you know you, you have to have the courage to sort of show it to other people and get criticism I mean my first scripts for Transformers were frankly terrible and 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 not just I mean and they were just terribly overwritten as well you know I didn't quite understand enough about the conventions of how much you can ask an artist to squeeze onto a comic book page and so it took you know more seasoned professionals to tell me that you know no you you scale it down four or five panels a page maybe you know six at a maximum you know dialogue balloons only a certain amount you know you just don't sort of go over about sort of say 20 25 words per panel or speech balloon and it's once I you know you learn those things that you start to improve and and it's only just practice and I you know I was lucky that I kind of did mine you know, as a sort of paying thing, you know, but it, you know, a lot of people now sort of are going the route of just creating their own comics and their own fiction and, and then sort of getting their professional work after that. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it, I, you just got to keep at it, really. Now, I'm also curious, what did college education or any of that come before you started actually jumping Not in? Not a huge amount. I mean, I did A-levels. I did up to, you know, sort of 18 at school and but I had no interest in university and degrees and I wasn't particularly academic, you know, I mean, I liked the English, you know, I could tell my leanings were towards, you know, the English language, English literature, but, um, you know, I left school with no real definite idea of what I wanted to do and I worked for a, in a bank for a time and, and then I moved kind of sideways into magazine publishing and that led to comics and, and so on, so it was, you know, the education didn't play a huge part in it. It was all inspiration. <laughs> yeah, you know, I always used to sort of write as a kid and create stories as a kid. So you know, and I loved comics. So you know, it was just sort of you know, serendipity that you know I went to work for a publisher that did comics, and I sort of they kind of moved me into that. It made sense. It was just yeah, the way it worked out. But it was largely a happy accident, and yes. and you know, I mean, there's a little sort of connective thing that I was working for a publisher called IPC Magazines. And my editor was a guy called Ian Rimmer on that comic, and he went to work for Marvel UK, and it was he who said, Sheila Craner is looking for writers at the moment. So that was kind of the, the bridge to Transformers as well, and Marvel and everything else. So, you know, lots of happy accidents, really. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. We've got to ask, with the release of Last Stand of the Wreckers, yeah. did you have any involvement? Or did Nick come to you at all with Nick it? Nick talked to me about it, you know, but I didn't get involved in the story side of it at all. You know, Nick talked to me about what he was going to do. You know, you know, he very politely, although the courtesy, just a courtesy, you know, could he use impact? Uh, you know, it's like, yes, yes, yes. And, you know, I mean, but I left Nick alone to do his thing on that because, mm. you know, I've seen he can write and it didn't feel that it was my business to sort of say, well, you know, you should do it this way, because I'm sure he was more than capable of doing it himself. So no, after a certain point of just seeing some of his early kind of ideas for the series, it's all Nick's work. 
And how do you feel it turned out? Oh, brilliantly. I thought it was a really good job. So, you know, and, you know, I wasn't the biggest fan of all how Megatron, but, you know, this kind of felt like the G1 verse that I'd set up, and, and that was what I liked about it. You know, Megatron, for good or bad, tried to kind of throw out a lot of stuff, it felt mm. like, whereas Nix obviously is sort of versed in, in the whole thing. And, and so, yeah, it just felt like this is the kind of thing I want to be seeing. Yeah, and obviously Nick's grown up on your, your yeah. work yeah. Um, and clearly got the inspiration for Wreckers from it. Where did the Wreckers come from initially? Well, I mean, that was Target 2006, I think, was the Wreckers original. Mm. And I, you know, honestly, I don't know where they came from as a concept, but, uh, you know, I think we needed a team for that story and, you know, why I called them the Wreckers even, I'm not completely sure. But, um, no, I mean, it was just, again, happy accidents, things, you know, that the story was telling me it needed, you know, they develop a kind of life of their own afterwards. I mean, we, we recently reviewed Target 2006, um, two of us and Adam who's here yeah. as well um, and we did the whole thing in, in one session and that issue with the Wreckers <laughs> introduction they are just instant characters you have instantly got an attachment within the one issue to the all of the characters yeah as you said they're just it just came to you yeah you've got the team the catchphrase some of the characters come from the toys but you know where did Wreck and Ruin come from <laughs> <laughs> We just wanted to do something different and you know we were always looking to kind of put our own stamp on it a little bit so it wasn't just a kind of catalogue for toys you know mm. and, and so we, you know, we did just drop in characters occasionally you know like Emirate Zaran and all these characters you know we just we wanted to give it more texture than you know and than just having you know it's a cast of toy characters so mm. you know you had Impactor you had Wreck and Ruin uh, Wreck and Ruin and you know so it just sort of it just gave it more of a feeling of it's ours, you know, it gave it more identity that these characters existed in UK stories and, and it kind of belongs to the UK almost. Mm. Well, Simon, thank you for being yeah. AA 2010 and joining us here for this interview. Yeah. Uh, we hope to get you on the podcast soon for possibly to talk about Nefarious in, yeah. and we've read the whole thing sure, in hindsight. Yeah. Yeah. And enjoy the rest of the convention and say thank Thanks you so much. much for joining us. Cheers, guys. Yeah, Thanks. <laughs>